future belongs to you. Oh Lord, my hallelujah belongs to you. My hallelujah belongs to you. My hallelujah belongs to you. Come on, sing it with me, choir. My hallelujah belongs to you, oh Lord. My hallelujah belongs to you. My hallelujah belongs to you, oh Lord. My hallelujah belongs to you. You deserve, you deserve it, you deserve it, you deserve it, all of my glory, all of my glory belongs to you, you Lord. All of my glory belongs to you. Oh Lord, all of my glory belongs to you. Yeah, yeah. All of my glory belongs to you. You deserve it. You deserve it. You deserve it. You deserve it. All of my glory, all of my glory belongs to you. All of my honor, Lord. All of my honor belongs to you. All of my honor, Lord. All of my honor belongs to you. Oh, yes. All of my honor belongs to you. You deserve it. Thank you. 
One more time. All of you. Give the Lord a heck of a praise. Sometimes, sometimes I get a little bit sad for church people. I do. I get a little bit sad for church people because a lot of church people believe that in here is where worship goes on. They wait to get to church on Sunday morning. That's when real worship occurs. But how many of y'all know that ain't where real worship occurs. Real worship is me walking around at my house at two o'clock in the morning and ain't nobody but me in the tears rolling. My eyes are lifted up to heaven and I'm crying out to God about how my hallelujah belongs to you. Private worship leads to public expression. If you don't have private worship, you don't understand what worship is. Can I get a witness? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so sometimes at 2, 3 in the morning, push my Bible away because it just gets too good to me. Start thinking about the goodness despite all my problems and my circumstances. And, and that's one of those songs. That's one of those 2 o'clock in the morning songs. Well, with tears rolling down your face, you say, my hallelujahs to you. My hallelujah belongs to you. My hallelujah belongs to you. My hallelujah belongs to you. You know why? This
I'm a worshiper. And maybe we don't talk about that enough at church because we see people in suits and ties and we see them in public places. But how many of y'all know I love Jesus? Anybody else feel that way? I love Jesus. And there's a romance going on between me and my expression in song. It finds its expression in service. It finds its expression in study. I love him. And my hallelujah really does. It really does belong to him. Oh, but I'm a worshiper. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Life. Life. I heard somebody say this this morning or earlier this week, and it brought tears to my eyes. He was talking about us as ministers, us as preachers. And he said, somewhere along the way, Preachers have started teaching theory instead of lifestyle. Somewhere along the way, we have started putting all of our trust in information instead of transformation. Somewhere along the way, we have started to tell people what the Bible says instead of encouraging people so that you can experience the fullness of who he is every day of your life. I want to talk about that today. I want to talk about how just because you are saved don't mean you ought to be satisfied. And if you're not saved, because the scripture says that there is something that comes at the end for both believers and unbelievers, different for the two. But the decisions that we make today determine what our, determine what our eternity will look like. Look with me, if you will, at Matthew, Matthew chapter number 20. Give our men a hand. We thank God for them. I love praise songs. I love praise and worship songs. We thank God for our men leading us in praise and worship today. Turn with me, we'll to Matthew chapter number 26. I don't have time to go over every verse that I'm going to go over in the message. And so on the front of your sermon PowerPoint, you'll see three different sections of scripture. First Galatians 20, but I just want to read one of them today for the sake of your time and your hearing. And we'll get to the others in just a moment. Matthew chapter number 26. Verse number 39. This is Jesus facing the cross, actually standing in the shadow of the cross. He would be crucified the next day, the very next morning. And he was in the Garden of Gethsemane with those that were closest to him, his disciples. He said, why don't y'all wait here? I'm going to go a little bit further to pray, to spend time with my father. And in Matthew 26, 39, Jesus says this, and he went a little bit further. You see it? He went a little bit further and look at what he did. He fell on his face and he prayed and look at what he said. Oh my father. Oh my father. 
if it be possible. I know what's coming. I know the difficulty that I'm about to face. I know, I know the hardship I'm about to go through on the cross. The hurt, the embarrassment. Oh, my father. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. God, if it's possible. But nevertheless, not as I will, but as it's about what you want. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord and let us pray quickly together. I won't hold you long. If I can spend 10 minutes on each one of these topics, I'll get you out of here in a timely manner. You'll be praying with me about it. And maybe the Lord. Let's pray. Together, and then us, as you can take your rest. Lord, if I'm not willing to live out my salvation in fear and trembling, then how do I know, Lord, that I'm saved? And Lord, the reason why I pray this prayer is because I've gone through stretches in my life where I've lived in rebellion against you. Rebellion against your authority, rebellion against your word, rebellion against your spirit. And those are the only times that I can remember in my years being on this earth since I declared I was saved. And to creep in as to whether I was what I said I was. And so, Lord, help us. Help us to be obedient to your word so that we won't lose the joy of our salvation. Help us to be obedient to your word so we won't start to doubt our salvation. Help us to understand that every day we are going to be faced with decisions. And the way that we decide determines truly what we are. Help us to put our faith in trust Jesus. The one whom we adore. The one whom even based on information given, even based upon knowledge that it was going to be hard, knowledge that it was going to be difficult, knowledge that it was not going to be easy, still bow down and pray, God. Give me the strength to do your will and not mine. Prayer today. Give us the strength to do your will and not our own. And if you choose to save a soul today, Lord, we'll be careful to give you all praise, glory, and honor. Convince those that need convincing. Convict those that need convicting. Convert and change those. These are all blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise today. There are three states, three states as we begin today. Three states that most people live their lives in. States that most Christians live their lives in. Once upon a time, I lived my life in fear. In fear as a believer. You know why? Because every single time I messed up, I remember what somebody taught me about judgment day. Every single day, I remember what somebody taught me about judgment day. And what I believe was this. I believe that But they were going to go on and on and on, millions upon millions. And even though I was, I was saved, I believed that God was going to call my name. And I was going to walk up. And with big screens just like these in front of everybody, God was going to replay my life. Because somebody told me you're going to give an account for everything you do. And trust me, if you lie, it ain't nothing you want everybody to know about. And I believe that it was going to show up right there on the screen in front of everybody. And I was going to be so shamed. And my mama was going to be there. And my daddy was going to be there. And Jesus was going to be there. And so I lived my life in, as a believer. Fear of what? Fear of judgment day. Even though I'm saved. That's bad teaching. That's bad theology. And that is not true at all. The Bible says there is now therefore no condemnation in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that your sins are cast as the east is from the west. Once you, are, once you get saved, you don't have to walk around with that burden on you about what you did. Covered by the blood. Everything that you have done, everything that you will do is covered by the blood of Jesus. You don't have to worry. It ain't nobody's business. But yours is. And if he died for it and forgave you for it, it ain't going to come up again. Bad teaching. 
on Judgment Day. So I lived in fear. But then there was a time when I lived in fantasy too. Living in fantasy means this. I believe that, okay, I'm saved. My sins are forgiven. So it really don't matter that much what I do today. It's all covered by the blood. You just said that. It's all forgiven by Jesus. You just said that, Pastor Brian. So I can get up today and I can mess up just like I did yesterday and the day before and it ain't really no big deal because Jesus died for it. You have transitioned from fear to fear. That's not real. That's not reality either. Paul said, should I therefore sin bounds in my life? And then he said something that I love. God forbid. God forbid. Should I sin greatly because I know that I'm going to get more grace? No, God forbid. The decisions that we make, the way I live, still. Your sin ought to hurt you more now that you're saved than it did before you got saved. That's why I don't want you to live in fear. And I don't want you to live in fantasy. I want you to live in faith. I want you to live in faith, trusting God and believing in his word, which is why God led me to the what I'm going to teach you. Today. There are three seats that I mentioned in scripture. Three seats that most believers that come to church every Sunday don't even think about or know about. And I want to show you how one of these seats applies to everybody. One of these seats only applies to believers. One of these seats only applies to unbelievers. There are three seats in Scripture. There's the seat of authority. How do you make your decisions? Who determines what? Then there's the seat of rewards. A lot of people are under the mistaken assumption that heaven is going to be the same for everybody. That everybody's going to get the same thing when we get to heaven. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that there is a seat that believers come before, and it's called the seat of rewards, the Bema seat. The judgment seat is what it's called in Scripture. So there's a seat of authority for everybody. There's a seat of rewards only for... And I was so wrong when I sang it. And I can remember getting up in the morning watching, I think it was Otis Mays or somebody like that on Sunday morning. And, and, and somebody was singing a song, I want to be at the meeting around after a separation of the right and the wrong. I want to be at the meeting around the throne. Y'all remember that song? You don't want to be at that meeting. I want to be at the great white throne. We'll be there. That's the seat of judgment. That is when people's lives are going to be pulled up. And everything is going to be in examine. But believers won't be there. That's for unbelievers. How do you know the real quick? And then I'll let you out of here. So three seats of authority. That's where we'll begin. Because everybody... Everybody has a seat of authority. What, what, what do you mean by seat of authority, Pastor Brian? Who controls you? Who controls the decisions that you make? A lot of people, This for, uh, if there's some teenagers in here, it's especially for y'all. There are some folk who are totally controlled by themselves. As a matter of fact, you are out of control. Because you are controlled by your flesh. You are controlled by your desires. You are controlled. Let, let me tell you about a young man that I met this week named, named Reggie. Reggie. I was talking to Reggie and Reggie said, Pastor Brown. Talk to me, Reggie. Why are you fasting? He said, Pastor Brian, for a week, I'm going to get up and from the time I wake up till 3 o'clock, I'm not going to drink anything. And I'm not going to eat anything. I said, talk to me, Reggie. Tell me why you're fasting. He said, because Pastor Brian, I need to remind my body that my body don't run nothing. When I get thirsty, I'm going to tell my body, you don't run nothing. When I get hungry, hunger, you don't run nothing. He said, in other words, I'm going to subdue my body by my will. Because I'm going to tell my body if you think you're going to control me. You got a lot of people in church that are still letting their thirst and their appetite. Anybody out there thirsty? Some of y'all are too thirsty. You are letting your thirst and your appetite control your decision making. You have a seat of authority in your life. And, you, and everybody has one. You have to determine whose will is it that you are going to do. 
The first thing that Jesus points out to us is that he came over and over again in scripture. I only put three, wrote down three messages. And by the way, there are literally almost 50 or 60 in the Gospels where Jesus says the same thing over and over again. In Matthew 12, 50, Jesus says, for whosoever shall do the will of my father, which is in heaven. That's Matthew 12. Brother, my sister, that's my mother. Whoever does the will of my father, not your will, not somebody else's will, God's will. John 6, 30, Jesus says this, for I came down from heaven, not. read Matthew 26 39 nevertheless Jesus says not as I will but as thy will when you get saved before you get saved devil controlling us but once you get saved you get a new person that sits on that seat you get a new king that sits on that throne and that is good God almighty that is Jesus and it is he who determines the decisions that you make on a day. When you wake up in the morning, you ought to tell yourself, it ain't about what I want, it's about what I feel. It's about what God has said. It's the seat of authority. How do you make your decisions? Does your anger determine what you do? Does your attitude determine what you do? Does your feelings determine what you do? Does your flesh determine what you do? Or does your faith determine what you do? Faith in Jesus, it ain't about what you want. He is the seat of authority. Let him sit in the seat. And the only way you ever start to obey God is you got to remove somebody out of that seat. Because you've been sitting in it your whole life doing what you want to do. You got to knock yourself out and put Jesus in it. It's him who has to sit, sit in the seat of authority in your life. Real quick, real quick. The seat of authority, as I mentioned, is for anybody. It determines the decisions that you make. And so here's the choice. Who sits on the throne? of your life. Isn't that amazing? We got some people that say that they saved and they still sitting on their own throne. People that say that they love the Lord and you still making your own decision. I'm going to smoke this if I want to. I'm going to drink this if I want to. I'm going to. I'm going to cheat if I want to. I'm going to steal if I want to. I'm going to do whatever I feel like. Well, then Jesus ain't on your throne. You on your throne. Because if he was on the throne, he would be the reigner and the ruler. He would be the king of your life. And every single time you make a decision, you got to go back to the throne and say, what must I do? The seat of authority in your life determines the decisions that you make on a daily basis. And if you don't, and, and by the way, your flesh going to keep on trying to pull him out of that seat. Your desires is going to keep on trying to pull him out of that seat. You got to say to yourself, Jesus is the ruler of my life. He's the king of my life and everything. I'm going to hold it up to scripture. I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to seek the Lord. And then, but Pastor Brown, what if it don't feel good? Pastor Brown, what if it's Pastor Brian, what if based upon the information at my disposal, the decision that I'm about to make is going to be difficult for me? Do what Jesus did. Father would that this cup would be taken from me. In other words, I know what's coming. But nevertheless, it ain't about what I will. It's about what you will. The first seat is the seat of authority. I made a graphic for you that shows two different kinds of lives. And I don't know if it's going to show on the screen, but there are two different times of life, types of lives. There's a self-directed life, and then there's a Christ-directed life. If you sit on your own throne, self is there, and Christ is outside the life, you are making the decisions. Your interests are directed by yourself, and that's why you got so much discord and dis frustration in your life. And you will never experience the beauty of the Christian journey, the wonder of it. Somebody said, when I let God drive, I have no idea where that car is going, but it always ends up in a good place. Can I get a witness today? When you let God drive, when you don't worry about putting your hand on the wheel, stop pumping the brakes and let God have his way. I don't know where you're going to end up, but you're going to end up in a good place. You're going to end up in a place of joy. That's Christ on the throne and self ain't nowhere in view. 
Your interests are directed by him. Your attitudes are directed by him. You get up and you don't feel like studying, but you do it because you know Jesus is on the throne. Somebody talked about you and you forgive them anyway because Jesus is on the throne. Somebody lied on you and you don't return life for lie because Jesus is on the throne. So on your seat. Make it about Jesus. But then, not only that, let's, let's talk about the second seat. This one is a little bit more difficult. The seat of rewards. This is the one that long time. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. It would be on the screen if it would show right. But if you have your Bibles, turn there with me. New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Verses 11 through 15. Verses 11 through 15. This is where it begins. If your faith is a house, Jesus is the foundation. If your faith is a house, Jesus is the foundation. When you get saved, you have just laid a foundation. And that foundation is Jesus Christ. It's based upon your testimony as a Christian. The fact that you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. In other words, you can't have a house without salvation. You can't have That's what Paul is letting the church at Corinth know. It begins with him. Jesus is the foundation. But look at verse number 11. For no other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's the foundation. But now look at what we are supposed to do as believers. Now, if any man build upon the foundation, he's supposed to build gold and silver and precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Now, listen to verse number 13. Here comes our day. Verse number 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare. Wait a minute. When everything that I have done is going to be pulled out. But not everything that I've done outside of the faith, everything that I've done in service to the Lord. Look at what it says. Because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work. Look at this. If any man's work abide, which he had built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Yet it's, what does that scripture say? That scripture says that as a believer, I'm supposed to be serving the Lord. The works that I do as a believer one day are going to come before God. And God is going to look past whether I'm doing it for y'all. Clap for me on Sunday morning. He's going to look past whether it's an ego trip. Pastor Brian just preaching because he got a big ego, just wants some folks to clap. He's going to throw it in the fire. Every sermon, every service, everything that I do is fire. And guess what? A lot of folks think that they've been doing a whole lot for the Lord. You're saved and you're going to be saved. And you're going to get to heaven one day. But when God throws your stuff in the fire, it's going to look like a fire sale. Woof. Because you did it for the wrong reason. The scripture says only what you do for Christ. It's going to last. Only what you do, not because of the money. I remind myself this all the time. I was called to preach. And if folks stop paying me to preach, I'm going to preach anyway. I don't have a choice. Y'all know me. Started a new job. Started a new job. Told Ron, say, what you doing, Pastor Brian? 7 o'clock in the morning, we're going to have a prayer and Bible study at the job. Prayer and Bible study at the job. We're going to pray. We're going to have a few minutes, about 15 minutes. What if it get you in trouble, Pastor Brian? I can't be nobody but who I am. That's what I'm called to be. That's what I'm called to do. And if men burn it up, if men try to burn my life down, one day God going to take it, throw it in the fire, and it's going to come out as pure gold. I ain't working for right now. I'm working for He'll remember we'll ever see it, Pastor Brian. It ain't going to get you an amen. It ain't going to get you a pat on the back. It ain't going to get you a well done. Yes, it is. Well done, my good and faithful servant. As a believer, you stand before the judgment seat. Next slide. I, one more scripture I want to show you. Somebody still ain't with me. Paul goes 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 10. That's why we work. Look at verse number 9, 2 Corinthians 5. Wherefore, we labor what? That whether present or absent, we're going to be accepted of all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the thing done. That's rewards. 
We all labor in the body. That's same people. And the reason why we serve is because graduate and I, I don't know if I don't want to just walk across the stage and get my diploma. I want him to say, come on, honor graduate. Well done. So we serve, we labor because there are riches, there are crowns waiting on us in heaven. We build for ourselves treasure in heaven based upon what we do as believers right now. And I got some sad news for some folks that's just been sitting around waiting. God says that when we all get to heaven, he want to know what have you been done since you've been doing, since you've been saved? Have you been serving me? Have you been witnessing me? Because your reward must stay thrown in the fire. And we're going to be given rewards. As believers. I'm still going to get in, Pastor Brian. Yeah, you're still going to get in. That's what the previous verse says. You're still going to be saved. But I don't know about you. How many of y'all want everything God has for them? Everything God has for me. What the reward is going to be, I don't know. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know how he's going to do it. But I know what his word says, and I want all of mine. Graduation is going on right now. Graduation. It's going to be like graduation day. Do you know, don't nobody, nobody get to come to the graduation that ain't graduating? You don't get no cap and gown if you ain't graduating. You don't get to send out invitations if you ain't graduate. You don't if you ain't graduating on salvation. Every believer graduate. Amen. But then I've been to so many graduations in my life, I can do it by heart. They'll say, Anthony Bryan. They'll say, Rolandis Rogers, Nathaniel Party. We all walk across the stage, we're graduating. But then they'll say, Javier Jones with honors. She graduating too, but she got a different tassel from the one I got. She got a different cover on the front from the one I got. Her cap and gown is different from we both still, we both still walking across the stage, but somebody graduating with honors. One day when I get to heaven, I don't want to just walk across the stage. I want God to say, Anthony Bryan, come on in. Are you graduating? But with honors. with rewards, with honors. So the choice is, do you want to just, I heard somebody say this before. Long as, long as I just make it in. You know, you know who that person remind me of? That person remind me of a person that pulls up to a neighborhood and it's mansions everywhere. Mansions all over the place. And they say, well, he's a nice, but just let just let me live in the shack. See, I'm inside the gate. And as long as I get inside the gate, everything going, I want my mansion. I want everything God has for me. Whatever my blessings are, I don't want to get, I don't want to just be in the community. There's a judgment seat for believers. But it is not our sins that get judged. It is our service judged. Your sins are forgotten, thrown away, forgotten, covered by the blood. Yes, sir. But your service is looked at. What you do in the body does matter. The decisions that you make today do matter. Whether you're active and involved in your church, whether you're active and involved, whether you're active involved in helping people, it does matter. The seat. The seat of rewards. I hear that shows. A diploma and ask this question, will you be an undergraduate? This is what I wanted. I, I, I thought about it for a minute. What, what if I could write anything I wanted on my diploma as I got ready to go into heaven? Matthew 25, 23 immediately comes. His Lord said unto him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I want to hear him. Who else want to hear him say, well done? Who else want to hear him say, well done? 
my good and faithful. That's what I want on my diploma. Not just done, well done. Not just completed, well completed. Not just good, but good and faithful. See, some folk can be good, but they can't. Some folk claim they're faithful, but they can't be good. I want them to say you have been good and you've been faithful. Good is the type of service I render. Faithful is my attitude when I render that service. I do it every day. My, but wait a minute, second seat, just given. What, let's, let's back up, seat of authority. See who sits on the throne of your life. The decisions that you make every day. Seat of rewards. What are you going to get when you get to heaven? And he throw out. And he determines whether they are gold or precious metal or silver or hay, wood, and stubble. Whether they burn up or whether they... You do know that when you throw gold in the fire, it just shines more brightly. When you throw diamonds in the fire, it just shines more brightly. But if it's wood, if it's stubble, it's going to burn even faster than wood. What's the reason why you do what you do? Seat of reward, seat of authority. Last one. Almost. Now, this is the meeting that we talked about. Revelation chapter number 20. Last seat, three seats in scripture. This is John looking into the future in Revelation chapter. And I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it. Yes. And how did he come? He came as a judge. Look at what the net rest of that verse says. From whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was not found no place for them. People are hiding. People are running away from his face. He ain't even said nothing yet. He comes as a judge. Yeah. Look at verse number 12. And I saw the dead. Small and great stand before God. And what is God doing? The books were open. Brian, why in the world, if these people are already lost, why in the world would they open the books? Ain't you ever heard of a verdict and then a sentencing? See, when you go to court, the verdict is rendered, but sometimes the sentencing don't come till later. If you die in your sins, you are going to hell. And it was by your choice, not because God wanted you to. You chose to reject God. And one day before the grave, absent from the body. But those that die in their sins are going to get up and have to stand before God. And God is going to pull open the books just so they can see that your name is not written in the book of life. Your name is not, and therefore judgment is about to come. The scripture says, and the books, the books, the books of life were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things that were written in the book of that word. That's why I need to get saved so you can get your name. Wouldn't be ready to die. If you die in your sins today, guess what? Everything that you did is still going to count. Why? Because it ain't been no forgiveness. Because you haven't accepted a savior. One day when you stand before God, wiped out. It hadn't been blotted out. And you have to give an account for everything that you did. That's why I'm so glad I'm saved. I'm so glad I'm saved. I told you this before. Why are you glad you saved? Because I was trifling. That's the best word. I, I, I've tried many, many times to describe one word description of Pastor Brian Foley got to say, trifling. That's the best one I can come up with. Trifling. Wrong and knew it. Low down and knew it. Smarter than everybody, slicker than everybody, quicker than everybody. Low trifling. Folks, it was trifling right there with me. On Sunday morning. Can I get a witness? That's why we ought to get happy on Sunday morning. Because if you know what you used to be and you compare what you used to be, I ain't got to look at you to get happy. All I got to do is look in the mirror to get happy. Because when I think in the book of life, except Jesus, I always imagine a pen appears before the book of life. 
and your name gets written, not in ink, but in blood, it's blood, yeah. in the book of life. And now nobody can erase it, nobody can take it out, and there's no judgment, no condemnation. Three seats that determine your destiny, three seats. Are you serious about heaven? Then you ought to be serious about your rewards, the seat of judgment of our works, the things we do in the body. And then finally, the judgment seat. One more time, let me talk to you about salvation. Talk to you about salvation. There is no other name by which men might be saved. When we study the Bible exhaustively, when we study the Bible comprehensively, when we study the Bible for all that it's worth, we come to this conclusion. There's no way we can make it to heaven except through Jesus. There's no way we can make it to heaven except, and, and the alternative is unthinkable. The alternative is something that I wouldn't even want to think about. I don't want to die and go to hell. I want to die one day and I want to be raised up again to spend eternity with him. And the only way you do that is through the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that if you can accept with your, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead. And what a great word for it. Salvation. We are saved from judgment. We are saved from embarrassment. When we go to heaven, there ain't going to be no embarrassment. There's going to be a day of joy. A day of joy. Now, for those of you who say, but Pastor Brian, Pastor Brian. Somebody going to be sad going into heaven. And I said, really? I said, I've been to many, many graduations. I ain't never seen a sad graduate. With honors, some just graduate, but everybody glad to be there. Everybody glad when they walk across that stage that they made it over to the other side. That's what heaven is gonna be like. Ain't gonna be no tears in heaven because if you make it over to you're gonna have joy on the inside. Thank God I made it, thank God I graduated. But God wants you to want the best, God wants you to want the best. If you have not accepted Jesus today, I'll forgive the Lord a hand clap of praise. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your salvation is dependent on it.